Please remain standing while the Reverend Gallimore says prayers, please. Reverend Gallimore. I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. Solomon, the writer of these words, is known for his great wisdom, described by many as the wisest man who ever lived. He was a man of great wealth and unparalleled wisdom, and he had a thousand wives. That's where I struggle with the idea of his wisdom. <laughs> The passage goes on to say, Wisdom is better than strength, and quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Perhaps helpful sentiments when we think about debates that get heated, and sometimes the loudest voice wants to be heard. Leadership is a great privilege and carries with it great responsibility. And you may already know, but I want to just tell you, the churches of Salford meet every month to pray for the city and for yourselves as the council. We pray that you would exercise wisdom as you carry out your responsibilities and know peace in the sometimes difficult decisions you have to take. I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to all of you for your committed service and dedication to the people of Salford. The focus of prayer this morning will be the spirit of Salford, the pride, passion, people, and personal responsibility of Salford citizens. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can come and bow our heads before you. We thank you that you are God and that you have created this world and that, Lord, you have given us within it responsibility to steward the resources that you've made available to us. We pray this morning for the pride of Salford, for all of its great achievements and its continuing development. We ask, Lord, that you would guide those who make decisions for the future, and, Lord, that there would be decisions that help this city to prosper. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for the passion displayed in this city, so many sporting achievements and so many people involved in works that, Lord, guide them to use their talents, their gifts, and their abilities to make this city even greater. Lord, today we thank you for the people of Salford, the greatest resource the city has. We ask, Lord, that you would bless this city, bless its people, and, Lord, may they know your hand upon their lives. We pray for our education services. We thank you for all of the children and their potential. We ask, Lord, that you would guard them and that, Lord, you would help us to nurture them. Lord, again, we come with a sense of personal responsibility to the task laid before us. We ask, Lord, for your wisdom. We ask, Lord, for your help and we ask, Father, that you would let us know that you are with us, that we are supported by the churches of Salford. Lord, we pray decisions made in this chamber will be a blessing and a benefit to our city. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Um, morning, everybody. Um, 
can I just mention the voting buttons, please? The um, when we take the named vote on the budget later, there will be the voting will be through the system in front of you. Where you've got a shared system, you need to press the correct uh, button. You'll see the one with your name on it. Um, you will see if you've picked up your um, microphone, which a number of you have this morning, uh, there's a card underneath it. Just leave those alone if you don't mind, because the re what they're there for are to reset the machine if you accidentally log out, which some members did uh, last time. Um, so if that does happen, then one of the IT colleagues will come and assist. Councillor Antropus is giggling, so this is a bad sign. But I don't think there's anything complicated on this. When the vote is proposed, you'll see the instructions on your screen, and it's quite straightforward, uh, and you will have time to amend it if you need to. Thank you. Did you all understand that? Hopefully. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, Council Lancaster. I'm joking. Um, can I ask for apologies, please? Any other apologies? Okay. Item two. Any declarations of interest of any members they need to declare this morning? No. <laughs> Item three. Report of the City Mayor 2018-2019. Revenue Budget and Capital Programme, City Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, just before I obviously present the budget speech to Council today, I was reflecting on some of the comments that the, the chaplain made in connection with, with wisdom. Um, and I guess since I've been in local government, which, you know, is coming up for um, six years now, really. Um, sometimes I think things are beyond wisdom, if I'm honest with you. And what I mean by that is even the wisest of men struggle in the circumstances we currently find ourselves in. And for me, that struggle is emotional. Um, it's passion. It's also about not really being able to see any logic in the world around us. So wisdom is important, but I guess also the environment in which we find ourselves quite often means we behave in certain ways. And for me, to be passionate against austerity, to be angered by austerity, is actually quite a logical and rational position to take, and arguably a wise position to take. So I'm here today to recommend that Council approve my budget for the 2018-19 financial year. This is my second budget as the City Mayor of Salford. Salford is a city I am immensely proud and humbled to serve. Leadership is humbling. I believe this budget represents, as far as is possible, a responsible, and fair set of proposals given the financial situation we are facing. Let me first outline the technical elements of the budget I'm presenting to Council today, which I'm legally required to do. Today I'm recommending an overall revenue budget of 
£500,000 for 2018-19. I'm also recommending a capital programme of £115,913,000 for 2018-19, using the resources set out in part three of my report. And in accordance with the formal resolution set out in Appendix 6, I am proposing a council tax requirement of £98,876,000 in accordance with the legislation. A basic amount of council tax of £1,516.80p and an amount for each valuation band again in accordance with the legislation. And an amount of council tax for each valuation band in accordance with section 30 and section 36 of the Local Government Finance Act 1992. I'm also recommending the Council approves the Housing Revenue Account Budget for 2018-19 of £15.43 million. Finally, from a technical point of view, I'm recommending that Council approve the Treasury Management Prudential Indicators for 2018-19 to 2020-21, as set out in Part 4 of my report. I now want to turn to the main part of my speech today. This year's budget has been a horrendous balancing act, and it's my grim duty to present the budget with further proposed cuts of £11.2 million this financial year. This year's cuts take the City Council's collective loss of funding to £198 million since 2010, with over 50% of our budget by the end of this next financial year having gone. The reduction in available spending has been enormous. And in the face of these tremendous pressures, I'd first like to thank the staff and the officers of this City Council for their dedication, their passion, and unrelenting commitment to the residents of our city through these awful, hard times. I think it's important also to note that times are not just hard for Salford. Across England, councils expect to face a funding gap of £5 billion by 2020. From there, things are only anticipated to worsen as core spending is phased out in favour of business rate retention by the end of the decade. Across our public services, austerity is ravaging social provision, segregating British society into the haves and the have-nots. Our NHS is in a financial meltdown. Police cuts have led to significant increases in violent crime, and local councils' care provision is stretched to breaking point. And in response to this national crisis, the government gives local authorities absolutely no choice but to raise council tax, a tax which we know is a regressive tax which hits the poorest in our society the hardest. 95% of councils in England are planned to raise council tax this year, with a further two-thirds looking to use their reserves just to enable them to actually balance their books. In total, council tax increases are expected to raise nationally 584 million for local services in 2018-19. This is compared and contrasted with a core funding cut in local government of £1.4 billion. This year alone, increasing council tax is absolutely no solution to local government cuts and austerity. In recognition that council tax alone will not pay for austerity, government have allowed local councils to raise precepts dedicated 
to particular services. 147 of England's 152 social care authorities are likely to introduce an adult social care precept increase in 2018-19, raising an extra £548 million to pay towards the national crisis we're facing in social care. The LGA has already warned that this number will be dwarfed by the cost of councils of implementing the government's living wage, and that's not the real living wage, by the way, which will rise to £1 billion by 2020. Unsurprisingly, in data acquired by the Local Government Information Unit, 80% of councils fear for their financial sustainability over the coming years. Indeed, the examples of Tory authority of Northamptonshire is a good example of them issuing a Section 114 notice last month. It's a grim indicator of things to come in local government. And with Conservative-run Surrey Council running a £100 million plus deficit, it seems the trickle of local authority budgets being pushed to failure through austerity and local government cuts has already begun. And I'd like to remind this council that that's even after the government made additional funding available to Surrey back in 2016 of £24 million, all sitting outside of the revenue support grant calculations. I do not believe it is any coincidence that both of these struggling local authorities are Tory run. Both were at the forefront, in my opinion, of the neoliberal race to the bottom, selling off assets, commissioning out services to contractors and forging ahead with the privatisation of public services. And as such, both have been stretched beyond their means in recent years, as the cheap money of the late 1990s and early 2000s boom has actually dried up. And the collapse of Carillion has also shown us that Thatcher and Blair's privatisation agenda has hollowed out local government and created a catastrophe within public services. Fragmented and under-resourced British public services, from health to policing to adult social care, are now all struggling to cope. Whilst many private sector confirms continue to rake in billions of pounds of public money, often paying their executives exorbitant salaries whilst taking on often minimal risk. Be it the collapse of the key forensic services, the private companies responsible for crime scene investigation units, or the spiralling costs of rail and gas in private hands, the British public is now footing the bill for a national privatisation disaster. The scale of the funding reductions we have already experienced and the scale of those we know are still to come means we have had to fundamentally review all of the services the City Council delivers. At the heart of all the decisions we have made is an abiding commitment to do everything we possibly can to protect those services that support the most, most vulnerable residents in our city. But we cannot hide from the fact that the scale of the cuts we must make means that even these services cannot go unchanged. As such, this year's budget contains proposals for an increase in council tax of 2.99%, with the addition of a further 2% increase in the precept for adult social care. These funds are vital to protect the continuity of our services, ensuring those that need the help of the Council most are not left out in the cold. Amongst other examples, this year our pooled health and social care budget will release savings of 1.9 million through a five-year plan investing in community-based services. No services will have been removed through this saving 
with increased investment from our adult social care precept. Public health strategy and change are to make savings of £668,000 and the Place Services Book Group will reduce its revenue budget by £1.837 million with a further 0.762 million of efficiency savings to be made from contributions to arts organisations, reduction in partnership costs and the use of online services. In addition to these savings and in response to the huge increase in demand for statutory services in Children's Services Department, Children's Services will not incur cuts this year. Furthermore, I am proposing to invest a further £4.5 million of additional resources into the department to maintain the level of service provision. These priorities, in my opinion, reflect the Labour Party's commitment and my own commitment to providing the best possible value for money for Salford residents in the face of disastrous cuts facing this local authority. We will continue to make prudent use of the new monies we're bringing into the city. But we must be honest with ourselves and with our residents. We have still had to make some very difficult decisions in proposing the budget measures before Council today. 75% of councils nationally are reporting a crisis in children's services. Nationally, Council's children's services are under huge pressure due to the impact of welfare changes, stagnating wages and insecure employment. We're seeing increases in cases of poverty and increases in the complexity of the issues children and families are facing. And at the same time, the government has introduced new burdens on local authorities to meet the needs of children. But it has failed to provide anything like adequate funding to meet these new responsibilities, creating further budget pressures for this City Council. For example, our children and families with no recourse to public funds now rely on the Council for their entire living expenses, yet we receive no funding to provide this support. The Children and Families Act extends our duty to provide health education and care plans for children and young people up to the age of 25, yet we receive no funding, other than a small amount of transitional funding to provide this support. The impact of benefit changes is putting more families at risk of homelessness, Yet for those families assessed as intentionally homeless, quite how anyone can be intentionally homeless is beyond me. We receive no funding to provide this support. And I'm proud of our commitment to our care leavers in the city. And these responsibilities are about to be increased from the age of 21 to age 25. Yet there is no planned new funding to provide this support. As a council, we're required to provide transport for children with special educational needs to travel to school and other educational establishments. The increasing number of children with special educational needs and with disabilities and our commitment to ongoing support is resu resulting in huge pressures in the high needs block of the dedicated schools grant of our budget and to the school's transport costs. Coupled with these unfunded pressures nationally, it is the need to ensure we support children and young people in our city. The biggest demographic change has been in the increase of our younger residents. And we're working both to understand these changes and to plan for the changes we need in this age group. After a year when we saw the numbers of looked after children in the city decrease, we're now seeing those numbers increase once again. This brings significant budget pressures in terms of ensuring the right placement is found for these children. 
Ultimately, Salford, as we know, is the 22nd most deprived local authority in the country, with a 26% rate of child poverty. And as a city, we've seen serious and entrenched social deprivation, which feeds an above average demand for resource from the local authority and our public services. These are all the reasons why I've written to the government ministers asking for a fair funding settlement for Salford. This is ultimately what I believe our residents deserve. And there are reasons that I've chosen, as you know, to pause the consultation on the future of our nursery provision for a month, to campaign with Unison, the families, the parents, the staff, for our basic services and fair investment in them. But despite the hardship, Salford as a city, as we all know, is growing. And the proceeds of that growth have gone some way towards mitigating the worst effects of these government-led cuts. For example, £1.6 million of additional business rate income and the £1 million income we've received from the new development at New Bailey are both being invested into services, cushioning the savings we've been made to make this year. But I do stress this is about cushioning, this isn't about mitigation. Ambition in regeneration is something that this City Council has done consistently for many, many years. And it is something that is absolutely necessary to ensure we have the resources and opportunities for the future. So today I make no apology for our continued investment in growth, as it's clear that apart from electing a Labour government, regeneration and growth offers us one of the few hopes against the madness of Tory austerity. The Quays, the Western Gateway, and the rede redevelopment of Salford's historic city centre have all been a part of the Council's bold investment strategy to create opportunities, jobs, and wealth for the people of our city. Carefully targeting the Council's resources can also help stimulate other investment in the city, promoting and creating the opportunities our residents need and deserve. Media City UK, Port Salford, New Bailey, Middlewood, Locks, Greengate, the RHS Bridgewater are just some of the current developments we've helped to create. Huge initiatives that will provide livelihoods, leisure and income for thousands of Salfordians. And in the next seven years, £4 billion of private sector investment is likely to come into Salford, which is expected to deliver 18,000 new homes, 1.6 million square metres of employment space and an additional 15,000 jobs. It will also generate significant amounts of much needed income in the form of new homes bonus, 80 million pounds in council tax and 120 million in business rates over the next decade. This is the money that can then be used to provide some protection for the services from the worst impacts of government funding. We're already benefiting from this approach, as many of you know, and the budget I've proposed today includes a number of one-off measures to cushion the impact on the crucial and overstretched services. But even in these difficult times, we are still, as a council, investing in those things that we know will support our most vulnerable residents. In September 2017, we relaunched Salford Assist, previously known as the Discretionary Support Scheme, and we invested a further £300,000 in that scheme, ensuring more vulnerable residents in urgent need following an emergency can access vital support in our city. To date, this has helped 1,654 residents with emergency 
assistance. That's a 78% increase on the previous financial year. We've provided just under 500 residents who were previously homeless or fleeing domestic abuse with furniture packages. We've enabled 30 homeless people to obtain birth certificates. We've launched a new food shopping voucher in partnership with Morrisons, reducing the number of people having to use food banks. And our £75,000 investment in Salford Food Share Network is already helping to make a big difference with the opening of the new Eccles Food Bank Distribution Centre in November. And we're taking even more initiatives, working with the Trussell Trust to look at opening a food bank here in Swinton, probably in spring of this year. Our council tax reduction scheme has been retained at its current level for the third consecutive year, helping 25,732 people on low incomes pay their council tax bill. Many of them are pensioners and families with children. We've boosted the pay of 300 care workers by 10.7% in the city, increasing their hourly pay to £8.30 an hour, well above the government's own national living wage. And as many of you know, we've been aware, earlier this year we agreed to invest an additional £590,000 over four years to open seven new libraries and upgrade computer facilities in the city's 16 libraries, at the same time when many councils up and down the country were actually closing them. We've also invested within our leisure facilities to generate additional revenue to offset the impact of local government cuts. I specifically think about what's happening in Worsley with the regeneration of the leisure facilities there and the expectation that will actually generate more income for the City Council. And we've provided an extra £70,000 worth of funding for the Council's Welfare Rights and Debt Advice Service, which has helped support 3,436 people with specialist free help and advice, helping to secure nearly £5 million of extra disposable income for Salford residents. All this is part and parcel of my citywide commitment to our anti-poverty agenda, as you know, launched in February of last year. However, the budget before the Council today is not the end of the difficult decisions. And as we know, in Salford, like councils up and down the country, we continue to face a tough financial future under this government. Local government continues to make more than its fair share of cuts as a consequence of the government's austerity drive. At a time when central government expenditure continues to increase exponentially, local government expenditure continues to decline. The exact reverse of what's happening with central government departments. Obviously, this is all as a consequence of Brexit negotiations and the need for the Treasury to put more money into departments to administer that. All of this ultimately can only harm the people who live in the city of Salford. I'm committed to do everything I can to ensure we invest in those services that matter the most to the residents of this city. And as we develop proposals over the next 15 months, I'm committed to talking to residents, members of staff, the trade unions across the city about how we invest in crucial services in this city. But I'm under no illusion, and neither should this council or the residents be. We will continue to face horrific, tough decisions. And I've had no pleasure in making today's speech and delivering these proposals to you. I do not think that the solutions for the future are going to be easy. I do, though, and sincerely believe that this is the best that I can possibly do in the current circumstances. 
Austerity is ultimately a political choice, and we will continue to fight the political choice that is being made by the Conservative Party. And it is with these considerations in mind that I recommend this budget to the Council today. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Now, could I ask for any questions or comments, please? Any questions or comments? Do you want to put your hand up so we can see it? In note, you see. Okay. Thank you, Mr Chairman. In considering the <coughs> Mayor's budget this year, um, firstly, I'd like to thank Joanne Harpen and her team for the the hard work they've done putting this together. It's um, like trying to tap down on the pin head. Uh, it's like an angel trying to tap down on the pin head at the moment. It's increasingly the case that the choices before us are fewer and fewer, and we find ourselves in a more and more difficult position. Traditionally, we will come to this council with an alternative or an amendment. Today, I'm standing to say that we will be supporting the budget the mayor is putting forward. It's not out of any great passion for the, uh, the measures put forward or any great belief in. Uh, some greater socialist agenda. I think, as the Mayor quite aptly stated, we are where we are. We are in the position where we have to do the best we can with what we have. The motto right behind the Mayor says, Salus Populi Suprema Lex. It means the welfare of the people is the highest law. We have to try and maximise the money we have now to do the most good. Uh, there's another quote from uh, Cicero who, uh, who coined that term. All loyalists are now in the same boat. We are all together in this now, and we must work together in the coming years. The next budget will be more challenging than this one. There is a shortfall of at least £15 million to consider, and we will have to put our heads together. We will have to put aside partisanship. We will have to start talking to each other as adults rather than opposing, uh, opposing ideas. There are things that I don't like about this budget, but we find ourselves in this position because year after year, ideological applications have been made in the budget and spending hasn't been as we would have had it on this side of the chamber. Arguably in some parallel reality where we have been setting the budget, things could have been different, but we now have to be mindful of the fact that we have to be realistic. I'm also um, a little surprised that the original intention to raise council tax to the, the maximum limit wasn't mentioned and in the context of the extra £800,000 that we unexpectedly found that we had. That means that the adult social preset this year will of course be 2% instead of 3% and that means that we'll be pushing 1% onto next year which of course will ease some of that burden. As the Mayor said, cushioning things. There are things we can do better and there are things we are going to have to do better and we are going to be scrutinising this at every stage. What I am offering now is to work sensibly, collaboratively, and honestly with you, but we are going to have to start talking to each other as adults, as people who want to make the city work. Thank you. Councillor Hines. Thank you, Chair. Well, it's, it's welcome to hear Councillor Clarkson's response to the Mayor's budget. I must say the Mayor's budget was comprehensive. It touched on every point uh, that, uh, that's absolutely necessary um, for this city going forward. And as I say, I'm welcoming Councillor Clarkson. The only thing I can say, though, it's about time. Indeed. It's about time. I can remember when I had the job of moving the budget, starting, you know, many years ago, but certainly since 2010, when at that time, and the Mayor touched on the point about austerity being political more than economic, quite frankly. And I can remember in 2010, almost eight years, well, eight years ago, at that, well, just under, because it was after the May election, but, making the point that the, it was political from the then Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition. Political in the sense that that government saw an opportunity brought about by a world economic crisis, 
And I admit that the government that I supported at times uh, got it wrong. Not because of the crisis that was created, but the fact that it itself, along with almost every other Western dominated government, thought that the good times were here forever. And that money that was created would trickle down to almost all the peoples of the countries. And I admit that, and I've got up in this chamber before today and made those comments. But nevertheless, that Cameron Clegg government used the opportunity for shrinking the state or trying to shrink the state. And that is unforgivable. And that is why I would suggest that Councillor Clarkson's on his feet today saying, well, we're all in it together. I can remember the Prime Minister saying that, we were all in it together. But the only trouble is, the rich have got richer, the powerful have got more powerful at the expense of ordinary people in this country. And we see, and I use these, this statement time and time again, we are living with almost every sector you talk about in crisis. Whether it be a housing crisis that Councillor Kelly has to deal with, whether it's a children's crisis that Councillor Stone has to deal with, partly, obviously, uh, the, the children's side of it, the health side of it, and that sort of thing. But the education side of it, where we see more and more teachers leaving their posts day in, day out, because of the stresses and the problems and the lack of support that they're under. We see crisis in the prisons. Good God, it must be horrendous what's going on in the prisons. We see crisis wherever you look, wherever it is. And yes, the opposition might say, well, we've got more people working today. But good God, some of the conditions that those people are working in are absolutely horrendous. The mayor is talking about, from a positive element, that what we're doing in food banks. Good God, we shouldn't have anybody food banks. That's the reality. That's the reality of the situation today. So I am obviously welcome the opposition statement that we're in it and working together. Quite rightly, they should scrutinize us. I don't think we've anything to apologize for what we've been doing over the last 10 years, of, of the last eight years, of we've mitigated the problems for the ordinary people of this city. But when he talks about, and he talks about supporting us, let him also say to us and condemn this government that's taking us a road to destruction day in, day out, throughout the period that they're in. And I can't see this government having any answers to the problems of the people that we represent going forward in the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hines. <coughs> any other questions? Councillor Merry. Councillor Merry. Thank you, Chair. Um, when I first heard that uh, Councillor Clarkson was not proposing uh, an alternative budget, I was thinking back to what he had in common with British industry under this current government, actually, which is a period of declining productivity that we're starting to see. If you remember, when he first took over this portfolio, we had a fully detailed alternative budget. Then we had what was christened the back of the fag packet budget, and, and now we have no alternative budget at all. And being of a forgiving sort, I, I listened very carefully to what Councillor Clarkson said, um, which I think in terms of a conversion ranks uh, on a par, and uh, people can comment more theologically on this than I can, uh, ranks on a par, I think, with uh, St. Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. He suddenly realised, 
over the years, we've been putting forward reasonable budgets, good budgets, and made the best of the circumstances. Uh, and I thought the, the, the Mayor's speech um, in detail set out what the crucial problem is, the catch that we're all in. And I have to say, with deep respect to Councillor Clarkson, by all means, talk to us and we'll talk back to you in a civilised manner and communicate. But there's somebody else you need to be talking to, and that's your Prime Minister and your Chancellor, and get them to realise the appalling state that local government is in. We now have a situation where a Tory council, a Tory council like Northampton, is now effectively being run by its auditors because they say they can't pay the bills. We have the description of Surrey Council, which was one of their flagship authorities, right, basically saying that they are declining in terms of the money they have available. And in the elections coming up in May, we have the leader of Wandsworth warning that their flagship council, their flagship council is in danger of being taken over by the Labour Party. This is as a result of the policies that this government has followed towards <laughs> local government. The central government has seek to put the cuts, to put the great majority of the cuts onto local government and say, here's how much money we're giving you, it's your problem to sort it out. And it's no good, it's no good saying, well, you can always increase the council tax and giving us permission to raise a council tax. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that yes, we, we do get um, a substantial sum from raising the council tax by 1%, but I'll tell you what, um, councils like Kensington and Chelsea get a damn sight more from raising the council tax by 1% than we do. And quite honestly, the majority of their residents and the majority of the residents of Westminster can afford it more than the majority of the residents in Salford. So although I welcome um, this sudden change of heart, this U-turn, if I might say so, um, by the Conservative group, although I welcome that, it doesn't allow me to forgive what their government has done to the people of Salford. And if they're serious about demonstrating uh, that they've now repented of their previous sins in terms of the policies they put forward. They need to join with us in making the plea to central government at their conferences, uh, at every time that they meet the front bench, and tell them the truth. Tell them the truth about what is happening to local government, that they are so slowly strangling it, whether it's a Tory authority, whether it's a Labour authority, we are all suffering the results of the policies being carried out by this central government. I urge everybody to support this, this budget. I'm delighted that it's going to be unanimous in this chamber, but it's only the start of the fight to convince central government that we have a role to play and that we should be given the resources to defend our people. Thank you, Councillor Mary. Councillor Callum Garrido. Uh, thank you very much, um, Chairman. Um, I've listened very carefully, as I normally do, uh, to the speech that's been made by the City Mayor. Um, and it was a very passionate speech given by him. And I know that he's the, the sort of person that has said what he believes, and, uh, and I welcome that. Um, I've also listened to Councillor Clarkson, um, who said that we must all work together. And that is the truth. We need to all pull together. Um, somebody says we should go down to government. I think if Bill had, Councillor Hines had spoken after me, he would suggest that I don't go down with him uh, after what's happened when we went down before to ask for government performance. So I just, um, I just uh, think that, you know, today... Is, is, is not a good day for all of us. Uh, but I want to ask a question. And the question is, why am I and the rest of the residents in this city paying seven pounds extra for the Labour Greater Manchester Mayor? These, this money is being actually... It, 
sorry, nobody interrupted anybody else when they were speaking. Um, if you've got something to say, I suggest you press your button and say it. The Labour leaders of this city, including the Conservative leader, all voted for this rise, and I want to know why. Why did you not stand like the mayors of the Midlands and tell their mayor that no, they weren't going to fund his office, they weren't going to fund his £110,000 salary, that our vulnerable people needed that money within the city? And I would like to ask why, why we went along with it. One of their leaders, and I won't quote who it is, I won't say who it is, said the benefits that this should, not will, but should flow from, the, from funding the city mayor, for the Greater Manchester Mayor, and that she thought that it was a reasonable amount. Well, I don't think it's a reasonable amount. We are in dire times. Why are we just agreeing to actually this rise, his precept, on, on us? Why are we not standing up and shouting from the rooftops that this will, will not allow it to happen? Because that money should be spent in the city. And can I ask, right, that if he's doing a lot for our city, I'd like to know what he's doing. I want to know whether he's going to come and support this council on fighting on greenfield land, uh, which he is so, so against anybody building on. Why is he not coming to Salford and speaking at a public inquiry? He needs to be here. He needs to be supporting this council on what they are doing. So I'd just like to say that I'm, I accept this budget and I will be voting for it with a heavy heart because I think that we're all going to be suffering. But I want to know why uh, we've all agreed to pay the £7 per household. Thank you, Councillor Guido. Councillor... Jolly. Am I on? Yes. Uh, just, I wasn't going to mention this, but Councillor Greedos mentioned it, about the mayoral uh, precept. Now, I think we've got to remember that, A, this was a system which was placed upon us by a Tory government, and we didn't want that system. And you don't get this system for free. I don't know how they manage it in the West Midlands, but, you know, the... the the, um, well, uh, just saying a Tory mayor isn't really an answer. I sit on one of the GM scrutiny committees, which looks at, amongst other things, the finances, and also the Greater Manchester strategy. Now, the work that is being done there is immense. It, it is immense. It's bringing in, or is projected to bring in, hundreds, well, billions of pounds worth of investment. They've got transport responsibilities. There's a transport plan. There's masses of work going on there. Now, you don't get that for nothing. You don't get that out of thin air. Officers from councils were doing some of that work before, but they're under massive pressure. So he's got an office, and it has to be paid for. So this was a system. This is a consequence of a system which we took because the Tory government said we had to take it. However, to come back to uh, the points I was going to make, in the early 1960s, in his book, The Affluent Society, John Kenneth Galbraith talked about private affluence and public squalor. And we are heading for, well, we're heading for half of that now. We're heading for the public squalor. But the private affluence isn't even there anyway. Certainly not in this area, it isn't. Perhaps there are areas and classes of society where people are affluent. But for many people, the affluence isn't there either. Um, that, of course, is the reason why last year's general election shocked the Tories so much, because there are so many of our people across the country for whom that affluence does not exist that they bit back, and the Tories were utterly shocked when they did, and that's why uh, their, their dreams of a massive majority evaporated in, into nothing. But for this budget, um, the Overview and Scrutiny Board looked at this two or three weeks ago, and, and in our comments, the... The, the problem with this budget across the country is that we're, is what's going to happen in the future. We've had to take uh, various reserves and provisions to look at the overspends in this year's budget. And when we look forward to the future, those aren't sustainable. We can't do that year after year. And what's happened in the last 10 years when we've had um, austerity imposed upon us 
is that every year we've looked at the budget and then we've looked at future budgets and you can see the cuts tapering down. But they're not tapering down. Every time we just next year, the next year, they're just as high and they taper down in the future, but they never taper down. Last year, we were looking at, for, the, for future years, in last year's budget, for future years, we were looking at the cuts coming down to 7 million and 5 million. And now what would have been a 7 million pound cut is projected to be a 12 to 15 million pound cut. It never ends. And that's the problem. You have a law of diminishing returns. You cannot cut forever. And that's what they're expecting us to do. And this is happening all over the country. We now have authorities like Northampton on the verge of bankruptcy. This was flagged up by the LGA two or three years ago, that if this went on, by 2020, councils would go bankrupt. What did the government do? Absolutely nothing. Well, what they do do is they let you put taxes up. You know, you know, they talked a while ago about we're putting so much extra into social, adult social care. No, you're not. You're letting local authorities put the, the taxes up. This is a government who, when they are talking about taxes imposed by themselves, tax is the ultimate evil. But they're quite happy to get other people to put taxes up to plug the funding gaps that they have created. <clears throat> so can this go on? Of course it can't go on. The Conservatives have, for the first time, supporting this budget. Maybe they're cutting their losses there and say there's nothing else that they can do. But it's, as Councillor Mary said, what happens next? Because all local authorities, Tory local authorities, the Tory-controlled LGA, are saying to the government, it has to end. We have a crisis in adult social care. And now we have a crisis in children's services across the country. It has to end, because otherwise, while this government is running around like headless chickens, spending 99% of its time on Brexit, terrified of 60 backbenches, they are neglecting virtually every other aspect of social policy in this country. And if we're not careful, we are faced in the next few years, not only with the collapse of local government in this country, but be through that, the collapse of essential services to some of the most vulnerable people in our society. It has to end, and I hope the Tories will join us in demanding from this government that it does end. Thank you, Councillor Jolly. Councillor Antibus. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was a bit concerned uh, about uh, Councillor Mrs Garrido's remarks uh, regarding the public inquiry in Worsley and suggesting that somehow uh, that uh, Andy Burnham's uh, role was to, to go there um, and help us to, uh, to, to, to win the case. Of course, um, Council, uh, Mr Burnham has no standing uh, in terms of uh, the planning system in uh, this area. He may have a view like everybody else in Greater Manchester has a view, uh, but he has no standing there and it would be a, a complete waste of public money to uh, ask him to, uh, to, to attend there. But what I'm worried about is that this is a diversionary tactic from the Conservatives when the real problem that we've got with this um, uh, public inquiry is that it is totally unnecessary it is a consequence of government incompetence and it will cost, it will cost this city council and its council taxpayers £100,000 for the second time. For the second time. We fought this public inquiry, it seems that we're talking about the Broad Oak public inquiry. We fought that, we fought that, and we won it. We fought it and we won it. And we won it. Okay. Personal explanation. Sorry. The statement was that by Councillor Antibus that it was because of our government. It was actually Peel Holdings who took this appeal, our, the, the, the granting of the, uh, against them, right, to, to the High Court. And in the High Court, the judge asked whether or not anybody had any problem. And the government did withdraw their objection, their, 
their thing, right? But that was because it was at the High Court, right? And this is the truth about the whole thing. This wasn't the government not backing us. The government backed us. And then when it went to High Court, right, on a point of legal matter, they had to withdraw. Well, Councillor Mrs Greedo is quite right. Uh, Peel did uh, take the government to court, and the courts found that the government did not understand their own policy, that they had written the national planning policy framework in such a way that it opened these sites up to uh, development when they ought to have been protected. And that was incompetence by the government. I stand by what I say, and I think that Councillor Mrs Garrido's comments were very helpful in supporting my stance. But my point is this that all the time we are being forced to expend money by central government uh, instead of prioritising it where we would like, and it's down very much to uh, the uh, central government. Uh, but I, I, I mentioned that simply because Council Mrs Garrido uh, introduced it into the debate, but one of the, the real reason that I wanted to stand in uh, I disagree with Councillor Mary Harry, who described the opposition of having a change of heart. I didn't hear anything about the change of heart in the speeches that were made. What I heard was a tactical withdrawal. What they want to do is to withdraw from the real debates about local government finance uh, and try to focus it on and uh, just accept the situation that we're in and work together. Uh, for, for once, they think we're all in the same boat. We must work together to identify the most effective way of cutting budgets and cutting services. And they do that. It's a withdrawal because they want to withdraw from the real debate, which is to ask the question, why? Why is it that in the fifth richest country in the world, we have inferior public services to many of the countries who are much poorer. Why is it that a government that promised to end borrowing by 2015, was it, is still borrowing 2.6 billion pounds? Where is all the money going to? We're so rich and still borrowing so much. Why have we got so much austerity? Why is it that we have food banks? Why is it we have an increase in the homeless sleeping on the streets? Why? And there's a very simple question. Tax cuts for the rich, which have created a black hole in the national finances of at least 8.6 billion pounds. Those are the official figures. 8.6 billion pounds in tax cuts for the rich. And it's exactly what Councillor Jolly has alluded to. The reason why we are faced with the constraints that Councillor Clarkson referred to, but seem to accept, is because we have a government that's committed to public squalor and private affluence. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm pleased that the Salford Conservatives have finally decided to, to work with us and, and realise that they've also got a duty to the people of Salford um, to try and, and help us make the best decisions possible. Um, what a shame it's only now, because I'm going to speak very frankly and honestly. I'm absolutely, I feel battered by this process. It's my sixth year of being in the Cabinet and going through this, this process for months, line by line, looking at where we're going to take money out of vital services for the people of this city. I'm, I feel absolutely battered and beaten down by it. I can't tell you how hard it is, the impossible decisions that we've had to make year on year, knowing that our residents are getting battered themselves, left, right and centre, by government policies, by bedroom tax, by universal credit. Don't roll your eyes at me. By bedroom tax, by universal credit, 
by um, uh, getting a bit angry by the cuts to benefits, by the cap on benefits, by rubbish wages, a rubbish economy that is not working for them. getting absolutely hammered right at a time when residents need them the most. And I know my services. I've been out, I've met the staff, I've met the people who use the services. I know how important the things are that we do as a council to the people in this city. And at a time when people need them the absolute most is the time when we've got half of our money taken off us. And the impact on services is absolutely horrific. So I'm pleased that you've decided you need to be grown up and work with us. But I ask you what you're going to do to stand with us, to, to actually to listen to the anger in the city and the passion and the need and stand with us and call on your government to give us our money back. Thank you, Councillor Stone. Councillor Robin Greedo. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, uh, first of all, I'm quite clear. I fully support uh, the position that, uh, that my party has taken this council chamber today. I think it is the only sensible uh, way to proceed at the present time, uh, and I fully support it. Um, just one of two things, in fact, uh, I, I just must come back on uh, Councillor Antifus's comments when he refers to the incompetence of the government in relation to uh, the uh, planning application in Worsley. Can I remind him that, in fact, the High Court found that it was the incompetence of this council by not having the correct housing figures available, that was the main reason why it was referred back to Secretary of State with the instruction that the inquiry be re-held. So let's get that straight. It was because we did not have the correct housing figures, uh, housing supply figures available, uh, that uh, that was referred back by the High Court, High Court uh, to, the, uh, to the government. So that, that, that's one point. Um, can I say, in fact, that there is only one I'm sorry, there seems to be a conversation going on here between... Okay. Constitution. Is it in order for a member to mislead uh, the, uh, the, the council? Uh, the decision of the High Court was a very clear one, and it related to the status of uh, greenfield sites, which had uh, a policy protection in the local plan. Um, it had nothing to do at all uh, with the uh, housing figures, um, which were uh, verified by this council in its uh, five-year housing supply. Uh, I just don't know where Councillor Greedo has invented this, but it is entirely untrue, and he should withdraw that statement. It's, it has no factual basis. It's fake news. I don't withdraw the statement. This is a correct statement, and in fact, the council has spent some time over the last few days in trying to put forward the correct figures uh, as against the figures that were previously given. So I stand by that statement. Um, can I just say, this, just coming back onto the budget, there is, wherever the money comes from, whether it comes from the council or whether it comes from government, there is only one pot of money at the, uh, at, uh, at the end of the day, and that is through taxation. Uh, therefore, the discussion has to be, uh, what do we do with taxation? Are we saying that tax should be increased? Are we saying that income tax should be increased? I know you talk about uh, taking it from the rich to pay the poor, but there is only so much you can take in that direction. So I really do think that we ought to face the facts. You know, the government does not have its own money. The government only has the money which is paid over uh, by uh, uh, residents of this country or, in, in fact, uh, uh, companies. Um, and I think it is worth also saying that where we have had huge rises uh, in council tax, and I refer back uh, to the days uh, uh, immediately before uh, the coalition government came into uh, effect, when for the previous uh, uh, 10 or 12 years, uh, this council uh, raised council tax or rates before it uh, by up to 80%, and yet we still didn't solve the problems that this city is facing. 
for decades and decades, uh, we have had uh, problems with poverty, uh, we've had people suffering in this city, but we have not solved those problems. And The collective figure over that period of time amounts to 80%. So the maths can be done, uh, the, figures, uh, the figures are there. Uh, so at the end of the day, I think you should be prepared to say on that side how we should raise the money. Should we raise it by income tax? Should we raise it by corporation tax? Should we raise it by increased council tax beyond the figure that we've done? I think that's a sensible question because the money can only come from one direction. Thank you, Councillor Greedo. Uh, Councillor Balkai. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I doubt that I'll probably get uh, applause like it's been given to other people. Uh, but first of all, I would like to pay a personal thanks to the City Mayor, John Merry, and uh, 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 <coughs> Mrs. Carruthers Watt for the help that they've given me over the last two or three months, and especially the mayor for the way that he recommended me to the mental health nurse, which has somewhat improved my health. Um, as you all know, I've always worn my heart on my sleeve, and I would just like to make some comments that have actually come uh, that we've heard today. We're gonna have to pay an additional amount of money in council tax. But let's not pretend that the Chancellor gives with one hand and he takes with another. Because if you get, well, I think it's this year from April, we get, he's increased the tax level by £350. But we don't get £350. We actually get 20% of that, which is £70. So I might be £70 better off because I earn over the threshold. But those people that don't earn over the threshold are not going to get that £70, but they're still going to have to find the council tax. You know, people knock what we do. And when you look at what the city mayor does, what the council, uh, sorry, what the cabinet does, and especially someone like Bill Hines. They have worked, and I will say it, probably sometimes almost 24 hours a day to make the budget balance. I will finish in May, but I felt that I owe it to the people of Swinton South to support this budget. Cuts are not fair. They hurt the most and the needy. We are in a situation with the nursery uh, schools that we're going to possibly have to close them. The last thing that the city mayor wants to do, the last thing that Lisa Stone wants to do, is to cut the schools. What the Tories have to do on this side is actually make representation. Yeah, sorry, just on a point of information, I think what um, Councillor Balcan is referring to is the local authority day nurseries, of which we have five in the city. There's certainly no proposals around cutting schools or school nurseries, just to clarify. Thank you. Right. The last thing we want to do is to cut away any services. But we are forced to do this by the Tory government. I'm not going to call it our government, because as far as I'm concerned, it is not our government. It's a Tory government that wants to get rid of local councils. We, 60 people in this room, although some are, are, have given apologies, want to serve this city. And the rug is being pulled from under our feet. 
We've got to stand up together, not sort of say, oh, we'll support the budget this time because you've got nothing uh, to put an alternative budget. It's very sad. It's very, very sad. When you look at the Old Bailey, you've got the scales of justice, and it's so unbalanced in that it, if the, um, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and that's what this uh, government aims to do on a regular basis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No applause. I told you. Thank you for that. Uh, because we've had such a number of questions and a number of members have indicated they want to speak, I intend now to take a break. Ten minutes. Councillor Lewis. Sorry, I thought I was getting a telling off there from walking across the front. Right, okay. So, um, I wanted to address the point that Councillor Greedo was making about um, about raising taxation to pay for the things we want. Fundamentally, this is an incorrect way of looking at it. And if you look at any decent economist, they will tell you that's the wrong way of looking at it. As a country, we make our own money. A country can't go bust. I can't remember it because it was, I was only five, so I'm sure you'll remember better than I do. In 1971, we came off the gold standard. Sorry, I'm rushing now because I'm dashing back in, so I'm panting. Take a breath. <laughs> I shall do. <laughs> right, so we came off the gold standard. And that time, um, our money was then fiat money. So we create our money to pay for the things we want. We have proof from the Conservative government that this is, you know, this is something they actually believe in. Because since 2010, they have created £435 billion of quantitative easing. Where has that quantitative easing gone to? Well, we all know on this side where it's gone to. It's gone into assets. Rich people have taken that money and they've bought things that they want or it's gone into the market, so we have this inflated market, and it's not actually gone to do anything worthwhile for the country. For every pound that's gone into quantitative easing, it could potentially, <coughs> if it went to areas like Salford, it could create um, some of the estimates are around £2.70 for every pound that is from quantitative easing. What we actually got from the quantitative easing that George Osborne created and the Tory government since then is eight pence for every pound from quantitative easing. That's appalling. They do, the Tories, the Conservative government do believe in the creation of money. What they get wrong is where to put that money. What we want on this side is that money created to invest in our communities because our communities need it. Please, if you would like me to take you around the areas of Little Holton that I represent and see some of the things that they are struggling with there, I am sure you will agree with me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Now we've got Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks to Councillor Clarkson, Councillor Mrs Garrido and Councillor Robin Garrido for speaking today. It's a rather surreal experience for me. I think it's my eighth or ninth budget council today. And 
we normally get some pretty robust speeches from the other side of the chamber. And for some reason, we're not getting it today. Councillor Turner, the leader of the Tory group, hasn't yet spoken about the budget. And we normally get from Councillor Lindley something very robust. And there's still time for them to do it, I suppose. We'll have to wait and see, won't we? But, but we'll, 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 we'll wait. I just find it very strange uh, that this is going on, that there's nothing that they've got to say. Just, I'm not going to give you the lesson in economics that Councillor Lewis has done, but I was expecting Councillor Robin Garrido to mention the magic money tree when he was going on there, because that's one of the things that his leader said, there's, there's no such thing as the magic money tree, it doesn't just come along there until they actually want the magic money uh, for the uh, DUP or, or, or something like that. So money can be found uh, when they actually uh, want it. I, 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 if I wasn't here today, the, the place I'd like to be would be a fly on the wall at Northampton County Council, where last night the Tory group passed a vote of no confidence in their leader. It doesn't mean that she ceases to be leader of the council because she survived a vote back in November and, and the standing orders say that she can't be removed as the leader of the council for six months after that. So she's, she's safe until May. But perhaps that's one of the things... That, I suppose what it shows here is... I'm not going to try and make... Um, cheap or even expensive political points. But um, I think it, what it's demonstrating is, and it's been I've been said before, that we're in a situation... It's not unique to Salford that we're in here. It's something that's affecting all councils across the country. The points... I suppose the strange thing is that I don't, this year, have to um, defend uh, the workforce here, because there's normally an attempt to lower the conditions of the workforce. And as every year we look at every opportunity to save money, and it's one that we considered very shortly. But we made it a firm decision that we were going to stick with national collective bargaining, that we were not going to have any cuts in holiday or sickness entitlement for the workforce here. And I think there's a I suppose the real reason I'm standing up in my position as lead member for workforce and industry relations is to pay that um, thanks to the workforce here for the work that they've done in increasingly more stressful conditions. I also want to thank the trade unions for the contribution that they've made uh, during the budget and look forward to working with them going forward in what's going to be um, a difficult year going forward. So, I think that's all I want to say today, is that it's thanks to the workforce and thanks to the trade unions for the cooperation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Jim Kent. And could I say that, because uh, we've had so many questions, that um, I think we'll be finishing the questions and asking the city mayor to sum up and respond to some of the questions. Okay? Okay, thank you. Of the council. Um, I had thought that I was witnessing a damaging conversion uh, on the benches opposite, um, but I rather, and, and I thought that from the speech from the, or the sermon from the, from the vicar this morning that the wisdom of Solomon was actually descending upon uh, the Tories. But I suspect that it was more in line with the comments from Councillor Antrobus that uh, it's a tactical withdrawal from the debate. Uh, because the reality is that you are losing this debate. Austerity isn't working. And I think the nation knows that, but you haven't yet recognized it. The world economy has not recovered from the crash of 2008, and you are pursuing the very same policies that the neoliberal governments of the 1930s pursued. 
which was to take resources and take money out of the general economy. Central banks have pumped 14 or 15 trillion pounds of dollars or yen into the world economy. But they've done it through the banks. The purpose was that the banks were supposed to distribute that into the working economy. But they have not done it. The reality is, what's happened is, many banks have bought up their own shares and increased asset prices. And of course, they have rewarded themselves by paying themselves huge dividends. Most of the money was supposed to have been recirculated into the working economy. 85% of lending goes into assets and goes into financial speculation. Only 15% goes into the working economy. Global debt is around 325% of GDP. We're in a desperate position worldwide. Now, there has been some growth in London and the Southeast because of the proximity to the financial concentration there. But other regions are not recovering. There is decline in home ownership, despite the fact that the Tory party was supposed to be the party of uh, property owners, homeowners. Productivity is very, very poor. And I've spoken in this chamber on several occasions about that. 30% below the other major economies, the United States and Germany and so on. So unless we have a fundamental rethink the way we do our economy and our finances, then we are going to end up with largesse for the few and poverty for the many. Thank you. Councillor Turner, Turner, and then we'll go to the mayor somewhere. Thank you, um, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Um, it seems that by public, public a vote that they want me to say something. So, so I don't want to disappoint all the masses in the public gallery and all the people that are listening uh, to this debate with great interest. Um, but I would, I would say that it seems clear from that side that the answer to all our troubles is a Labour government. Well, I think that's probably the last thing we'd want. <laughs> I'm popular, aren't I? Um, the, the, the reason being that would bankrupt the country, quite simply, and the people they seek to help will be the people that will pay the price. Now, I have to correct Councillor Robin Garrido because he... Oh, he's gone! He's gone! Oh, dear. Vanishing act. Actually, he got his figures wrong. It won't surprise you, but he got the figures wrong. Because since 1997... And between 1997 and 2010, the Labour government raised council tax by 108%. Um, so if you're suggesting that, I think that that's wrong. And of course, this was reinforced by a gentleman called Mr. Williamson, a top Corbyn ally, who... Oh, sorry. I didn't hear it. On now, yeah, point, uh, point of factual information when the poll tax was introduced into this city, yes, yes, it's true. For many people in the city, your tax, your council tax, poll tax, your rates went up 100 percent overnight. For many families, it went up 200 percent. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Turner, please. Interesting, but pretty irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. I'm just stating the facts. It was 109%. It was doubled. And if the Labour government, God help us, ever get in again, they will bankrupt this country. They will borrow like you've never seen before. And the, at the moment, the deficit hasn't been cleared, as promised, I admit that, but it's gone down two-thirds. It's a start. So... Um, if you, and when you think about it, actually, we have made a, a marvellous job of saving 109, not cutting, saving 198 million. But before that, when money wasn't in austerity, the word that the city mayor uses wasn't about, you still doubled the, the council tax. So come on. 
Anyway, I'm not saying any more because I wasn't going to speak anyway, but Councillor Ferguson tempted me into saying a few words. And I know it was popular. Thank you, Joanne. Sorry? Thank you. And the other thing, another person that, that really needs to be thanked is, is Joanne, who's taken over from Neil Thornton in the preparation of and the help that she must have given in this budget must be phenomenal. So yes. we, we thank her for that. But I, I've finished now because uh, I think you all want to get home and you don't agree with me anyway, do you? Thank you for that. Now, I did indicate before that I'd finish with uh, Councillor King, but I thought the opposition uh, leader had the right to come in at that point. Is there anything new you're going to add to the debate? Councillor Sharp. Yeah, just a, a brief one. I've uh, just gone and printed 10 party membership forms for the Labour Party for anyone on the uh, Tory side that wants to join. I'm going to ask this. I'm going to ask the City Mayor to summarise and respond to any queries that came up during questions. City Mayor. Councillor Antrobus, come on, control. <laughs> um, how do I respond to all of that? I mean, there's an awful lot here, but I'll try my best to do that. First of all, responding to Councillor Clarkson. Austerity and local government cuts, as you know, have been in place since 2010. So far, the local authority in Salford has lost £186 million of its budget as a consequence of direct reductions to the revenue support grant from government and increased budget pressures. 47% of our budget has already gone as we move into this next financial year. I find it heartening that you have agreed to work with us and obviously sensibly, I think was the word you use, and collaboratively and responsibly um, take us forward. I guess the concern I have is why has it taken you so long to suddenly realise that you need to be working with the Labour group in the interests of the people of this city. You know, it's taken 47% of our budget to be taken away from us for you to wake up to the reality that austerity and local government cuts are having a disproportionate impact on the lives of the people of this city. You know, we call it a D Damascus Road kind of awakening Nonsense. You've known about this. You've known what your government has been doing to local authorities up and down this country. I do agree that actually the support for the budget today is a ta tactical initiative, really. I don't think you're being sincere. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. We need to challenge this government about austerity. Your government assume it's a level playing field up and down this country. Your government assumed that we can raise revenue locally to pay for public services. It is not a level playing field. I said in my speech, we're the 22nd most deprived local authority in this country, in the whole of this country. What that actually means is we need more resources to deliver services, to lift people out of poverty, to create opportunities and to provide good quality public services. And I think Councillor Antrobus was absolutely right. You know, the fact that you've supported the budget today demonstrates to me that you don't actually want to challenge local government financing. The other day, I found out, just by reading The Guardian, that a council had been given £60 million or more, actually, to deliver council housing. It was a Labour authority which is absolutely fantastic. But you know what? It was your government that took that decision. It wasn't the local authority. They don't have the resources to build council housing. They have a cap on the housing revenue account, which prohibits them from borrowing. And I think some of the things we're forgetting in this chamber today is that we live in a state, in a democracy, that is wholly controlled, by and large, by Westminster and Whitehall. The decisions that Westminster and Whitehall make have profound implications for what happened in this city. 
So when we talk about raising council tax and it being a local decision, it's absolute nonsense. The government have forced us to increase council tax this year by 4.99%. They also introduced last year, as you know, the adult social care precept to fund a national crisis in social care. All of these are decisions not by this council. These are decisions by the Tory government. So let's wake up to the reality. Yes, work with us. Let's challenge the government because we live in one of the most centrally controlled states and democracies in the developed world. What Westminster and Whitehall does and what your ministers do in policy and resource terms has profound implications for the people of this city. So join with us. Join with us in challenging austerity, in challenging local government cuts and how they are disproportionately impacting some of the most vulnerable people in society. Councillor Hines talks about crisis. You just look everywhere up and down the country at the moment, you see crisis. You're absolutely right, Councillor Hines. Housing. People can't get onto the housing ladder. Why? Because we believe in the market. Houses have become an investment vehicle for global capital. All it's about is making money for the rich and the poor are suffering as a consequence of this. The cap on the housing revenue account stops us from building council housing that we can actually rent at an affordable rent to the people of this city, forcing us to have to engage with the market and obviously the national planning policy framework which Councillor Antrobus said. The national planning policy framework protects developer profits before it actually commits to building truly affordable housing in the city of this, this Salford. Also, the national planning policy framework stops contributions to infrastructure because every single agreement has to go through a viability assessment to determine whether or not the developer, the private developer, can afford to make contributions. These are policies that your party and your government brought in to this country. And you have to take responsibility for some of this. Look at social care. Social care is in utter disarray. We have care workers in nursing homes not even being paid the real national living wage. In many respects, we're breaking the law. They're not being paid for sleeping times. And, you know, HMRC take great delight in telling the country all of these employers up and down the country who are breaking the law. Well, if it wasn't for the outsourcing and the commissioning of services and the hollowing out of local government and the state, dare I say it, we wouldn't be in the predicament we're in today in social care. And this dates back to 1992, as I said earlier, when I was speaking with the nurseries. The introduction of compulsory competitive tendering, the idea that the market is the better vehicle for delivering public services in this country. That has not been rolled back. It's not been rolled back under New Labour either. And unfortunately, I'm horrified because we had an opportunity to roll back the control of the market on public services and we chose not to do it. We engaged further because we continue to go down the road of private finance initiatives and public-private partnerships. The third way that has cost this country an absolute fortune. Then when we look at children's services and education, I did highlight in my speech that, you know, the government has created more burdens for local government up and down the country. None of it is being funded. Absolutely none of it. It's an absolute disgrace. You know, investing in children and the education of our children is absolutely a sign of a civilised society, in my opinion. We're not doing that. Why are we not doing that? Because we've got a government that believes in austerity and local government cuts that is happy to devolve responsibility for absolutely no resources. We have a crisis in the labour market. People on zero-hour contracts, part-time employment, low pay when they want full-time hours. You know, what are the implications of this for people's lives, for families, for children? Have we actually just reflected on that for a minute? If you've not got enough money coming through the door and you're being forced to choose between paying your council tax, paying your rent, putting food on the table, paying electricity bills, paying for your children to, to jump on a bus or use public transport, you know, has anyone actually thought about the impact of what's going on here? 
We have a very precarious labour market now, where people are struggling to make ends meet and being forced to choose between heating and eating. That, again, is not a mark of a civilised society. And on the issue of poverty, I absolutely agree with you, Councillor Hines, but I have no choice as a human being that is motivated by human welfare and human rights. We have to respond to the crisis within our communities. People are in poverty, and it's right and proper that this local authority puts money aside to help them with those circumstances. It's absolutely the right thing to do. Do I take delight in doing that? Absolutely not. Would I rather not be doing that? Absolutely. But unfortunately, people are suffering in this city, and we need to respond to that. Councillor Mary was absolutely right. The government are slowly strangling local government, I think is what he said. Absolutely right. And you and we need to talk to your Prime Minister, your Chancellor, and also all those Cabinet members involved in local government to get a better settlement, a fairer deal for Salford City Council. And it isn't a level playing field. You know, what this city council brings in in council tax and business rates is not the same as some, some of our London boroughs or some of our southern counties. It's absolutely not the same. We have a very different housing profile. Most of our houses are in bands A to B. They're not at the other end of the band spectrum. That brings in more money into the coffers of this council. We also don't have a huge business rate base post-industrial decline, when the service economy and the City of London and the South East were the priority economically for the government. And we're playing catch-up in terms of bringing business rates into this City Council. But, you know, one of the things we do have in Salford is great growth opportunities. And, you know, it's about making sure we harness those for the people of this city. In the short term, things look absolutely horrific. You mentioned as well, Councillor Clarkson, about the future. We've got another 15 million, as the budget stands at the moment, to take out of our budget after this next financial year. And that's providing we don't get any further budgetary pressures within year. We've already seen in children's services in this year the budget increase by £6 million. Why? One, because government aren't funding those services, and two, because of austerity and the impact it's having on our families and communities in this city. Councillor Greedo, you ask about Andy Burnham and the devolution deal. What are we getting for the money? I will remind you that the people of Greater Manchester didn't actually ask for a directly elected mayor. It was your government that told us that we would not get devolution in Greater Manchester if we did not agree to a directly elected mayor. Now, where this becomes interesting is this idea of getting devolution. Because actually, in hard cash terms, it seems to me the government aren't giving us significant amounts of investment. We're having to fight tooth and nail to get any additional resources out of your government. Just to give you an idea of some of the things Andy Burnham has been fighting for over the last nine months. £243 million worth of Transforming Cities Fund has come into Greater Manchester. Some of that, as we already know, is going to be used for improving cycling and walking across the whole of Greater Manchester, getting people out and about and more active to reduce spend in other areas of public life. We've had 3.8 million come in to tackle homelessness through the Trailblazer funding. We've had 1.8 million come in for the social impact bond, again to try and tackle homelessness and get those numbers down and get people with a roof over their head. We've had 2 million in terms of the mayoral capacity fund from government as well to help with overheads and the costs of the combined authority. But yeah, things are difficult. Things are absolutely difficult. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But dare I say it, the reason why things are difficult is because your government don't actually believe in devolution. Devolution is about devolving responsibility and not necessarily resourcing it. This is a sham. This is an absolute sham. We have to fight tooth and nail for every bit of investment we get into Greater Manchester. We're currently in negotiations at the moment over a housing deal for Greater Manchester to hopefully enable us to build truly affordable housing. 
Now, one of the things your government could do is just lift the cap on the housing revenue account. Let local authorities build council housing so we make sure that housing is truly affordable. But no, your government don't want to do that. Your government absolutely don't want to do that. What they want to do, and this is what devolution means, is they want to devolve responsibility, but they want to retain the resources. And that is an absolute disgrace. Also, Andy Burnham has introduced, as you know, half-price tickets for 16 to 18-year-old people to make it more affordable for them to travel around Greater Manchester for jobs and for employment. That is a development I personally think is a good development. He also led the response on the arena attack. And you saw the, the shambles that was in terms of trying to get money out of government to pay for the real costs that we actually incurred to respond to that. So, you know, when you say, what is he doing? I'm giving you some examples here. He also brought together digital leaders to look at how we create a tech industry within Greater Manchester. We're doing stuff on the spatial framework, as you know. Cycling and walking is a key aspiration of Andy and the mayoral team. He's working hard with the community and voluntary sector. We've just landed another 69 million from government in marginal viability to deal with brownfield sites across Greater Manchester. Hopefully, Councillor Greedo, that answers some of your questions about what this money will be spent on and what Andy Burnham is doing within Greater Manchester. But let's not forget, devolution is about devolving responsibilities and not resources. And as long as the government are obviously bought into that philosophy, we'll always be challenging them for every single penny. Councillor Jolly, I agree. Austerity absolutely does have to end. And it's good to see our colleagues on the opposition agreeing with us on, on that. Councillor Antrobus, um, I agree that you know, the Tories were very much engaging in tactical withdrawal from the budget proposals today. And I think you're absolutely right to call out the fact that there's been an 8.6 billion tax cuts for the rich, which has translated into cuts for the poor in many respects. We talk about taxation as well. Let's not forget the tax avoidance that goes on within this country. Let's not forget the tax evasion that goes on in this country. This isn't just about taxing people more. This is about actually trying to pursue those that don't actually pay their taxes legally or illegally, as far as I'm concerned. Councillor Stone, um, I welcome your passionate speech. And, you know, like you, I, I feel very frustrated, very frustrated, very angry, very upset. Um, and that's for a whole host of reasons. I know how hard members of my mayoral team work. I know how hard members of staff in this local authority work. I know how people are genuinely motivated by the public sector ethos to do the best they possibly can for the people of this city. But year on year on year, the cuts keep coming. The cuts keep rolling. Austerity continues to bite in this city. And like you, Councillor Stone, I also feel absolutely battered. I never got involved in local politics to set budgets which mean people lose their job, which means we lose services, which means the vulnerable people of this city continue to be hit. I absolutely didn't. I got involved in local government, I thought, to do good things, to help people, to be out in the community. Most of my time spent these days is in restructure, reorganisation meetings, budget meetings, looking for extra cash that we can put into the budget to try and make the budget balance. Those are the reasons I got involved in local government. It wasn't to do what we're doing today. But we have to set a legal budget, and that is very much the challenge before us today. Also, moving on to Councillor Garrido, um, I think, you know, I, I welcome the points you make about supporting the budget. And it's going to be tough in terms of moving forward. Everything I said in my speech was sincere. It was honest. It was genuinely how I see the world and how we need to move forward. Also, Councillor Balkin, who I know is not here anymore, you know, it, it does concern me when members' health and well-being is suffering for a whole host of, of different reasons. But it was really, thank, I really thank him really for, for what he said. You know. I take the welfare of every single member of this chamber really, really seriously. And it's good to hear, unfortunately he's not here now, but it's good to hear that he's supporting 
this budget and will continue to support our campaign on trying to retain the five local authority day nurseries. Councillor Lewis, I think you articulated really well um, what's going on here in terms of the broader economic picture. Councillor Ferguson as well, I, I'm with you, it is a bit of a surreal experience this because we've got the Tories agreeing with our budget and not necessarily coming forward with proposals. Um, but I'm also with you because this is probably the first year I've been on the council where the Tories haven't come forward absolutely hammering terms and conditions of employment for the staff who work in this city council. The staff who work in this city council, as far as I'm concerned, deserve absolutely every penny they get. They work tirelessly. They work around the clock. Recently with the day nurseries, I was engaging with staff in the evening, you know, exchanging emails up, up until one o'clock in the morning, contacting staff at weekend. You know, let's get a grip of ourselves and let's really properly understand what's going on here. You know, these are the staff who are dedicated to this city who are worth absolutely every, every penny. And I also thank the staff for working with us on the budget, and I thank the trade unions as well, because this has been no easy budget. It's absolutely not been an easy budget. This year, I've tried my hardest to offset the impact by using one-off savings. But once that money's gone, we can't spend it anymore. So we really do need to think creatively about the future and how we continue to set legal budgets in the city of Salford. Councillor King, thank you very much for your exposition on the global economy. I know you always like to talk globally about matters, so, and I agree with everything you said, you know, neoliberalism isn't working. I think international institutions such as the IMF, the World Bank are acknowledging this now. There is a massive decline in home ownership, productivity 30% below other comparable economies. You're absolutely right. And you know, the government needs to take responsibility for some of that, you know, because at the end of the day, it's the economy that is somewhat responsible for what we're facing today. If we had a productive economy, if we had an economy that we could trade globally, dare I say it, we wouldn't necessarily be in the position we're in. But we have a government that has presided over a failing economy and the future looks even bleaker. Councillor Turner, you refer to there not being the masses in the public gallery. And I take that quite seriously, and I, I was reflecting on that. One, we're holding the council meeting during the daytime when a lot of people are actually at work. But also, let's remember this as well. People are having to work harder now than they ever have before to make ends meet for them and for their families. Have people really got the time to come and observe the council? You know, that's the question I ask you. That's the reason why we probably don't have people in the public gallery. People are struggling to make ends meet and every penny they earn absolutely matters for them and their children. And on that, I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you, City Mayor, Councillor Dennett. For that. Now we're going to go to the vote now, but before we do, and the vote is going to be, do we approve the recommendations in the report that's been given this morning? So Miranda, do you want to say something before we go to the vote? Um, City Mayor, just, uh, sorry, Ceremony Mayor, just to say, people will see the stopwatch having come up. You will see on your own named uh, button um, the options to vote and if there are any difficulties could you indicate just by raising your hand and we'll make sure somebody can assist. Sorry. Right. What is this numbers coming up? I press your button. Is yours working? Yeah, I've just pressed it and it's shown a green card. Oh, good. You should go. Oh, you've done it. So what do I press your button? Green. 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 Green.
I press my side, then press. So I press mine, and then I press the plus. Yeah, you need to pop in. Yeah. Oh, 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 We're not locked in. We didn't touch it. Paul did. <laughs> <laughs> it was Paul. No, I, I, I looked and went, need IT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one at a time, ladies. Right, so Just having a fan. So you press the picture of you. Go on, then. Go on. <laughs> I've done all the magnets. Should we have already been locked? Yeah. How would you have locked everyone out? Yeah, so when, when you put when you it back in, you press your side, then you press the icon to the face, and then you press what's on my right. That would be a problem with the that's why you've got a car, she said. Sorry? Yeah. No idea. No idea why. We really needed another instruction. I'm on. Oh. Seeing that new technology drives us backwards, we're going to have a show of hands. No. Those in favour of the... Right. Any abstentions? On the show of hands, any abstentions? No. Go through it. A name vote right. for the budget. Okay. Miranda. Yeah. City Mayor. Quiet, please. City Quiet. City Mayor. Four. Councillor Antrobus. Councillor Bolkind, Councillor Barnes, Councillor Bellamy, Councillor Bentham, Councillor Boschel, Councillor Brocklehurst, Councillor Birch, Councillor Clark, Councillor Clarkson, Councillor Cohen, Councillor Collinson, Councillor Compton, Councillor uh, Councillor Critchley, Councillor Dawson. Councillor Dobbs, Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Karen Garrido, Councillor Robin Garrido, Councillor Hamilton, Councillor Hesling, Councillor Hines, Councillor Hudson, Councillor Humphreys, Councillor Hunt, Councillor Jolly, Councillor Jones, Councillor Kelly, Councillor King, Councillor Lancaster, Councillor Lewis, Councillor Lindley, 
Councillor McIntyre, Councillor Mascheter, Councillor Merry, Councillor Morris, Councillor Mullin, Councillor Curranziza, Councillor Councillor Pevitt, Councillor Reynolds, sorry, Councillor Gina Reynolds, Councillor Neil Reynolds, Councillor Ryan, Councillor Saunders. Councillor Sharp, Councillor Stone, Councillor Taylor, Councillor Turner, Councillor Walsh, Councillor Warmisham, Councillor Warner, Councillor Watkin, Councillor Weir, Councillor Michael Wheeler, Councillor Peter Wheeler, Councillor Paul Wilson, Councillor Ronnie Wilson. Four. <coughs> Motion is unanimously carried. I think that was unanimous. Thank you very much for that. And we're going to move on business. I know that was very important, and I did give a bit of leeway for people to speak as long as they possibly could. So thank you for that. Can we now move on to item four, which is the 2018-19 Treasury Management Strategy, Annual Investment Strategy and Minimum Revenue Provision, Policy Statement, Billy Hines. Councillor Hines. Thank you, Chair. Now, you, you'll be pleased to know I'm going to take you through this line by line. <laughs> I'm already kidding. But as you know, I've come a number of times, uh, obviously, to this chamber, uh, with the Treasury management position. First of all, I'd like to say, and the Mayor touched upon it in his budget speech, I and have said it so many times, do not apologise for the amounts of money, uh, the capital programme that we've embarked upon over the last, certainly since I've been on the council for 34 years, and the leadership that was before me carried on through Councillor Mary, the Mayor Ian Stewart, and, and Paul now as Mayor. I think it stood us in good stead over those years, uh, even though at times the opposition have been critical of us uh, because of our unsupported borrowing. But once again, just like the Mayor, I do apologise for what we've done. Having said that, it's absolutely crucial that we look at every single item that comes in from a capital programme perspective uh, and make sure, because we now as our budget and as the Mayor has touched today, our cuts have come down. You know, we've taken nearly £190 million worth of cuts over the last eight years. The ratio between what we redeem in debt goes up and up, and therefore we've got to be cognizant of that and uh, therefore make sure that our borrowing is absolutely justified. And obviously, I think that's part and parcel. Now, on the Treasury management uh, position, of course, what this is about, it's more or less, in simple terms, a cash flow position to make sure that as money's come in, uh, we're able to obviously pay our bills. And at the same time, if there's any surpluses there, uh, or like overnight borrow uh, lending or whatever else, we get the best deals that we can possibly get. And we're advised to do that. Yes, that costs us some money. But we're advised to do that, uh, and we're very, very, I believe, quite honestly, very, very good at what we do. That doesn't mean, of course, uh, that we can become complacent. But when you look at the, uh, the report, you can see that what the, the important parts are, uh, certainly on the introduction, uh, section one, as I've just said, it's about how we invest monies and the benefits that we get. The capital prudential indicators, those are in our gifts, uh, in our gift, and we need to review that continually about the, uh, the indicator. There's an item there on borrowing, uh, there's an item there on the investment strategy, on treasury management policy statement practices. And therefore, of course, this is a technical, largely a technical position. And therefore, you know, if there are any questions, I mean, I would appreciate that if questions were going to come in, they could have come in uh, prior to this meeting so that I can do my very best uh, to answer them. I'll do whatever I can, but if I can't do that, I'll make sure that members do get an adequate response 
uh, to where we are with treasury management. It is important. Sometimes it just goes through. Uh, I don't, you know, people think, well, okay, it's somebody else's business. But it's important that we understand exactly uh, where we're getting money from, what we're doing with that money, and to get the best results. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, is it up still? Thanks for that, Councillor Hines. Uh, any questions or comments? Councillor Jolly. Councillor Jolly. Um, it's not so much a question, but just to say, um, the, this strategy will be being reviewed at the Old Review and Scrutiny Board next week. Um, retrospectively, unfortunately, this year because of the, the time scale and the budget. Um, so if there is anybody who has any questions um, about the Treasury management, then if they can let myself or Karen Lucas know, then we can feed those in and ask those questions at the meeting of the board next week. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Do we all agree with the report? Any abstentions? <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that. And I think now that the finishes the business of today, thank you for your uh, good behavior. Uh, although it was pushing at times, I think uh, you needed, I think you wanted to go on all day, but uh, uh, thank you for that. And now I uh, uh, suggest that the council now is finished and that we uh, go and have our lunch and think about very much of the, the, the decisions we've made and the, uh, the decisions that affect all those people in Salford. Thank Councilor you. Councilor Garrido wants to speak. Councilor Garrido, just very quickly. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I was asked earlier to uh, withdraw a statement which I made, uh, and I said at that stage that I would not withdraw the statement. And I reiterate now that I'm not withdrawing the statement. And can I please refer Council uh, to paragraphs three and four of the High Court's decision, which relates to the, which relates to the inspector's failure to take into account policy EN2, which is in relation to housing supply figures. And if you actually look at the inspector's report, page 65. That's not a matter for this council this morning. It's going to be dealt with through the legal process, and the response to that will come from that. The meeting now is closed and all of us will be enjoying an afternoon off. Thank you. OK, right, that's fine, because that did come up with you, but before it looked like it was coming up with Councillor... Uh, nice, 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 nice,